Okay, good evening, everybody. <laughs> Kyle, can uh, we have Kyle Larson as chairing the meeting tonight because our regular chair is, is not here this evening. Um, Kyle? Hi there. Welcome everyone to the 2017 uh, or the uh, February 17th, 2021 special uh, planning and zoning meeting. We're going to be looking at uh, the proposed zoning code for the uh, downtown Cedar Falls. So we've got a presentation tonight and some discussion afterwards. Uh, our ongoing meetings are uh, being held via Zoom because of the pandemic. And uh, you can find how to log in and participate online. You can call in or you can use a link via Zoom. Um, on that note, um, the uh, uh, are there any plans of of the moving the the, the meetings being brought back to um, the council chambers, Karen? Um, yeah, we, we will be working on that. So it uh, we'll we'll let you know as soon as we have a plan to move that forward. Okay, very good. So I guess uh, um, as a special meeting, we we don't have any. Um, any public comment tonight to start us off? So we'll jump right into the presentation. Um, do we need to call the meeting to order, Karen? Yeah, so um, I will just take the role and then I'll introduce uh, our consultant team tonight uh, for our special presentation. Uh, Sears? Here. Hartley? Here. Holst? Here. Uh, Larson, we know, is here. Uh, Mr. Leeper is absent tonight. Lynch? Here. Prado? Here. Saul? Here. And Sherrod? Here. Thank you, everybody. Uh, well, tonight we're very pleased to have back by popular demand um, our consultant team. They were here just last week to talk about uh, the College Hill Vision Plan. Uh, but they've been diligently also working on um, the zoning code update for downtown Cedar Falls. And that is based on the work that they help the city with and the community with for the downtown vision plan, which was adopted in 20, November of 2019. So uh, we have uh, three people from the consultant team here this evening, uh, Jeff Farrell, uh, Mary Madden, and Elizabeth Garvin. Uh, thanks very much for being here tonight, and I will turn it over to Mary. Mary, you're muted. Thanks, Karen, and thank you, members of the Planning Commission, for welcoming us back again so soon. Um, Karen may have preempted a couple of my first slides, but I am ready to jump right in, Jeff, if you want to start the slides. or not. Jeff, you're muted now. And we heard you just a few moments ago. Person being muted, I thought I had my, sharing my screen and I hadn't. All right, are we good now? Yes, thank you very much. Um, as Karen mentioned, we're here to talk about the zoning code update for Imagine Downtown. Uh, next. Um, this project started in the spring of 2019. The city council adopted a set of priorities and all of these were incorporated in the plan, but tonight we're really gonna focus on number seven, which was establishing a zoning code update, clear and objective standards. I want to highlight uh, the study area for you just as a reminder. It is larger than the area traditionally thought of as downtown. We have gone as far south at, along Main Street to 18th Street and west, a little bit uh, west of Overman Park. Um, so we picked up the neighborhoods around the core of downtown. And if anyone's curious about exactly those areas were picked up and where 
order was drawn, because we're focusing on the zoning code, it actually picks up with the commercial zoning in downtown, as well as all of the properties currently zoned R3 and R4 around downtown. So that's why the boundary maybe is a, a little bit zigzagging, but it does pick up the areas uh, that have higher density zoning for residential around the downtown core. Um, next. We um, started off this project much like we showed you last week uh, with the analysis of downtown and then we held a public charrette. We did do it in person. It was not virtual for downtown. We got to meet a lot of people hear their thoughts about what should happen in downtown. We had a similar organization, lots of meetings with different experts, local stakeholders, et cetera. And we wrapped that up with a work in progress presentation, um, at which point we drafted a downtown vision plan and we came back and presented it to the planning commission as well as the city council. And as Karen mentioned, that plan was adopted in November of 2019. Uh, which maybe seems like an eternity ago, but we went to work at that point really trying to translate that vision plan into the new zoning for the downtown study area. So I want to give you a little uh, high level of what we've been focusing on. Next. The plan had a lot of recommendations, but not, not all of them related to development regulations or zoning. So I want to uh, just highlight we were challenged to really think different. People reminded us downtown is not the same as the rest of Cedar Falls. It plays a very specific role, so that's important. Um, we heard a lot about the importance of walkability and people places in the public realm. And so one thing that zoning does in that regard is really talk about the building facades, the private development. Um, we also heard there was a lot of interest uh, to create more housing options. Uh, Cedar Falls is, does a really great job on subdivisions and apartment complexes, but there was a feeling that there could be a wider range of housing, particularly in those neighborhoods around downtown. So this code really looked at that. Um, we were also asked to update the process that would be used for development review and approvals. Mary, you're, uh, like Mary's having a little technical problem. She'll be back. <laughs> She's got the, the Fayetteville, Arkansas stutters. Looks like it might be a little bit more than our usual uh, delay. <clears throat> well, at the risk of you hearing this again, and in the last, uh, not the last button, last uh, um, is uh, it, uh, an idea, of course, the park, the parkade has come back, is really successful uh, for some time. Now let's expand on that so that it's not just the parkade. And when you get 10 feet off the parkade, a really different situation, let's expand that and uh, look at the parking requirements. And a real big idea about focusing on the sense of place. Uh, this, this is, as we said, with the think different uh, slogan up front. Mary's trying to get back in um, and she will be sometime, um, but it's a different approach to zoning. And this is one, um, focuses on a sense of place and the, the aspects that make that happen. Uh, again, <clears throat> everything you're gonna see is really rooted in uh, what we heard uh, and what is in the downtown vision plan. Um, now I'm gonna do a little bit of a walkthrough of a form-based code, two different ways of your form-based code. Um, the, the first way, I'm not gonna just start with um, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. I'm gonna do that second, but first I wanna give you a kind of a, a user's guide and uh, as, <clears throat> as if you were uh, a lay person, you don't understand about zoning and you haven't been involved in those things. Um, so starting from kind of scratch, assume you own a piece of property or you wanna know what that lot on the corner is gonna be able to do. This is a how to use the code. Um, 
we refer to this piece as the three easy pieces. The first one, the regulating plan. Find your property on the regulating plan. A uh, regulating plan is, uh, I'll go ahead and kind of brag and say it's a 21st century zoning plan. It's uh, different than, but uh, roughly similar to a zoning map. And we're going to zoom in now. <clears throat> um, somewhat at random, but not really. We're going to zoom into a, a particular lot. This, <clears throat> this is in the, the core uh, of a downtown on Washington Street, just a block off. And uh, zooming down to this lot, it's a corner lot. You see their, their colors, their lines. First thing to notice is these, uh, these red lines up at the street. This is a required build to line. <clears throat> the, that line says, start your building here. You have to place some minimum percentage of your lot has to have the face of the building sitting on it. Um, that's the first one. The second one, the blue line is a parking setback. That's a good old fashioned setback. You can do anything, anyhow, any way with your parking, as long as it's behind that line. Uh, depending on the market, it can be a surface lot, underground, uh, above ground, et cetera. And I will point out because uh, you see the uh, asterisk number one, there's some special uh, particulars for lots that have an alley corner so that you can have, you can imagine a house that has a garage back on the alley. You can park in that area as long as the parking is within a building. And uh, what that's about is making sure you don't have to do that. Uh, kind of a simple thing, but uh, that's really deadly to the health of a, of a city as a, as a place for business or just walk, walkability, which is connected. <coughs> and then the other thing I haven't pointed out is that big flood of orange in the street. The way that the regulating, regulating plan works is uh, if you want to see what the rules for your building are, what you can build uh, in three dimensions and form, it goes by what kind of a street you're on. So this orange street is an urban general. And the, by the other side of the street will have the same rules. Um, that sends us to the building form standards. Piece number two. And on the regulating plan, there's a key. In this case, that orange is what we call urban general. <clears throat> and it's generally, you can think of it as the part of the downtown that's just off the parkade. Uh, our code is set up with, starts off with intent for each of the frontages, pictures and text to give you an idea of what in general terms, what the intent is, what this is after. Uh, and there's clear text letting you know this is advisory. The rules, um, these are not the rules, these are advisories. We also have as part of that a section that shows you the configurations that are possible under this code. Now, in general, this urban general type, and most of the types are pretty consistent about the way the building faces the street. These configurations show the building from the block interior or from the alley side. All the buildings are up to the street in front, but it shows you how there's so many different ways to do that. This is to get uh, property owners, designers, developers to start thinking about different possibilities and not feel like they're confined to a box. Uh, the rules now are set up uh, in categories, placement, height, uh, elements, and uses. And it's a combination of simple text and simple diagrams, the purpose of which is the goal is to eliminate the gray areas. Either it's clear, I can do this or I can't do this. Of course, purely 100%, no gray areas is impossible, but we try and get as close to it as we can. Uh, height, <coughs> clear, clear references, minimum heights, maximum heights. Um, the elements, uh, these are things like balconies, porches. For most of the downtown, the biggest aspect of this, and it's critical, even though it sounds very simple, is the fenestration, getting windows and doors. Um, the code's rules are concentrated on the facade, the very public part of the building, and we're, we're pretty strict about getting that right. 
less controls on what happens on the sides in the back of the building. But uh, you think about administration, it's pretty straightforward. You can say, well, nobody would build a building without windows and doors. But then you think about it and you probably had to walk by some. Um, and then the uses, uh, we do have a use chapter and, and use tables that are connected to your larger set of uses uh, in the rest of the code. But the form-based code governs <coughs> with a, a lighter hand. For the most parts, it treats uses in broader categories. There's more control on the building form, less control on the uses because the form of the building really kind of corrals what those uses are. And then one particular spot I'd like to kind of focus on. Uh, in the placement, it talks about private open area. This is not uh, a front courtyard. This is really a uh, kind of private area that's outside for the occupants or the users of the building. Uh, <clears throat> In the downtown uh, buildings, it could be a roof deck, balconies, or, or uh, some area behind the building. But we did a calculation on this particular lot, which is a typical uh, Cedar Falls lot, 66 by 132. Uh, I hope I got that last one right. Um, and the percentage of the buildable area for this lot comes to that roughly that square. So it's not an onerous requirement, it's something that should happen naturally. A lot of these buildings um, in this area are going to have some residential in them, and this can be satisfied. It, it, it's a big factor in the livability, or if it's offices, even the quality. And these can be roof decks. I didn't mention balconies. That's a way you can satisfy part of that requirements. I thought it's, that's one little bit of dipping down into the weeds. Now, this is a, a kind of a visual example. I think you might all recognize this building. Um, Simple example of how the how laying down the form-based code, the, the regulating plan with its required building line can coordinate development now and in the future. If uh, the property owner decides to redevelop this site now or whenever, uh, whatever they build is going to be organized by that required building line, as will the lots down the street. So say if this uh, this business decided now, I might do my office somewhere else or have it in one of these townhouses, but I want to redevelop. Um, this set of five townhouses are right off the required building line. One thing, the graphic, uh, we, I, I'd say we just didn't take the, the long time to knit that in. Actually, the required building line applies to the main body of the building. These stoops and steps would be sticking out in front of it. Um, and then now look down the street to the next lot. Whenever, if that owner decides to rebuild, put more on that property. Say, so here's an example. That's uh, for Clay Street. That's the same, uh, the same set of building frontage standards, the rules for that building. But it's a kind of a different type. Small apartments instead of townhouses. But you see they have enough in common. So as you move down the site, there's variety but they still hang together. And then the aspects of the streetscape, sidewalk improvements, street trees, et cetera, that make it a complete place and a lot, uh, a lot better to live in and walk along. <coughs> I mean, now the, the, third, the third part, the architectural standards, up to this point, um, you know where the building sits, you know it's going to be on this line and if you walk across the street and the sidewalk the building's going to be about right here you know it's going to be at least so many stories tall but not more than this you know uh, things about it that are that are um kind of uncolored it's like a mannequin you see in the back of a department store it's got the form but not the character well the architectural standards are a little bit like that um they're organized purpose and intent mainly they're talking about materials and configurations. We sometimes call this the dress code. Uh, it's part of where the character comes. And I can't help it, but I always have to point out, um, you know, I've got on a bow tie and things like that, exterior of the building, uh, hair, no hair, et cetera, makes a difference in the building. The form standards and the frontage type gives you the basic rough form of the building but materials and character come with the architectural standards. And we're going to go more, we'll show you all the chapters, all the parts that that covers in just a second. This is a little graphic to make a point 
<coughs> that the architectural standards, this is, this is the, the, the city of Cedar Falls. Uh, it's not a gated community or it's not a historic district where everything has to look exactly a certain way. And the architectural standards aren't set up to uh, force a style um, or an exact look, it's a materials palette. And the idea is a little bit like this. Uh, these buildings have a different look, but there's some consistencies to them. So they would be fine side by side together. Cities are more interesting because they have that variation. What's most important and what the form-based code does overall is assure that these buildings are good urban buildings. They function, they have windows and doors. Um, and, uh, and maybe light rail is in the future for uh, Cedar Falls. So to, so to recap, the three easy pieces, go to the regulating plan, find your property, see where the built line is, what the frontage is, go to the building form standards, see the rules, form and function in three dimensions, and then go to the architectural standards to see what your palette of materials is. <coughs> All right. Now I'm going to go, I'll, I'll be quick, but I'm going to go pretty quickly through the chapters of the code itself. Uh, not, not getting into content, but just sort of so you know where to look. Introduction and definitions. Uh, I think we've talked to you before about the idea. Uh, the form-based code uses some words in really precise ways that are about physical configuration. So wherever you see small caps in here, that means you should go check in the definitions we're meaning that in a really precise way, and we try not to do that with everything. <coughs> the regulating plans, uh, the regulating plan chapter, this is really something that very few people are going to use. Um, I'd say there's really, there's some property up in the far Northwest that's going to need to be subdivided, and there's perhaps one area, maybe two, on the far East that kind of, uh, call it the, the belly of... Um, of the downtown form area where there's, a, where there's a, a hunk of land that's too big and to be developed really would need to be subdivided. Those kind of, I'll call them big players, would need to look to the regulating plan to see how that would have to be subdivided so it would fit in with the rest of the downtown. Everybody else within the plan who wants, to, even if you want to build a whole block, uh, you would not be dealing with this chapter. So that's, that's there for when it's needed. Um, most people, the form standards, very important, of course, <clears throat> talked about this a little bit before, and the varieties are, here are the sort of five different kind of characters for the downtown character area, and the urban general frontage, the storefront, which I would say, think of the parkade, that's the only area we're requiring this, um, neighborhood medium frontage, one of the close in neighborhoods, um, actually in the regulating plan, this applies to the area to the south and the east of the core of downtown. Neighborhood small frontage, Overman Park, but it's for uh, a slightly, as it sounds, uh, new development. We're, in both of those cases, we're being careful that these are new houses, uh, some multifamily, but we keep the scale down so if there's new uh, infill in those existing neighborhoods, it uh, keeps to the character of what the neighborhood is. <clears throat> and then finally one, uh, the cottage courts, which could be built in either neighborhood. The idea of taking on one lot, uh, a series of really small cottages organized around a central green. I think you probably all heard something about these. It's a, it's a pretty interesting building type and uh, one that would add a really different, uh, different kind of way of housing to um, to Cedar Falls. Although although you sort of have one already, we'll point that out later. Uh, quick point: uh, the neighborhoods downtown is not just downtown, um, and you probably already know that. But looking at the regulating plan, there's kind of the hot colors: the uh, the, the bright orange and the bright yellow, or melon and the red. That's the downtown really mixed use buildings core, and then the blues on either side of it, those are the neighborhoods. They're part of the downtown character district, but they're close in neighborhoods. <clears throat> A very little bit of other uses in it, primarily um, residential though. And 
architectural standards. These are quite extensive, covering the building walls, external, obviously, uh, roofs, eaves, and parapets. And again, these pair an intent page and photographs with the rules themselves. Windows and doors, uh, critical chapter. Shop fronts, where someone wants to do a retail shop front or is building a new building on the parkade. Uh, street walls and fences. Entry features, front porches, stoops, canopies. Lighting and mechanical. <coughs> you shouldn't have to walk down the sidewalk past meters um, or be looking at air conditioning units hanging off the tops of buildings. And uh, signage, in part because in an urban environment like this, the, the viewpoint for the signs is a completely different place. People are in the street, not looking across a big parking lot or from a freeway as they drive by. So the placement for the signs and their appropriate size for fitting in, uh, partly for aesthetics, but also so, they're, so they function uh, is a little bit different. Uh, public realm standards, think about the space from the front of the building out to the curb and the travel lanes, getting the sidewalk, the door yards, and uh, the street tree area right. So those are coordinated and uh, coherent and healthy. Uh, parking and loading, because that stuff's important uh, as a kind of a, a simple rule that stuff's in back behind the buildings where it's used by other owners more efficiently. And the building functions or the uses. And again, a use table, the form-based code treats these in broader categories. Uh, one thing it does differently, sometimes there would be different rules for the ground floor than for the upper floors. Uh, the, the simplest example is uh, on the parkade in a shop front area, uh, you really want retail there. Uh, up above, maybe that either office or residential, it's really pretty flexible, but the parkade is one place where it'd be precise. The ground floor needs, needs to be retail. So form-based coding introduces some aspects, some instances of vertical use zoning as well. And a couple of special things to mention. Actually, it's more than a couple. Uh, sorry. The first is there's a, there's a particular part of the code that talks about what we call neighborhood manners. And um, that comes from the idea oftentimes uh, when people are doing new development <coughs> or say revitalizing a corridor, they really think about the success of these new buildings from the front. And they don't really think about how it impact might those new developments, which tend to be more intense than the existing neighborhoods, how they might affect, say, single family houses right behind them. Neighborhood manners address that directly so that where there's new, more intensive development, we have uh, kind of setbacks, um, minimum setbacks, setback planes, et cetera, to make sure that these new buildings, which are likely to be bigger or oftentimes will be, don't tower over, loom over the existing single family houses. So it's sort of, uh, and, and that's the way it should be. They should complement one another. Uh, people who live in a neighborhood right next to some redevelopment uh, shouldn't feel like uh, their house just got more, less livable because they have this big behemoth looking down on top of them. So we've got extra protections for that. And uh, I wanna roll through some things that uh, the form-based code doesn't allow. Uh, the basic kind of parking, this is, <clears throat> this is a slide that is, um, it's townhouses and that's, that's a good building type, but by having the, the cars come from the front, it looks like cars are a lot more important here than people. Uh, it's hard to see the front doors. And if you're walking on that sidewalk, most of the time you're walking in a curb cut. So, you know, it's not really a sidewalk. You're liable to have somebody pull in and out of their driveway. The form-based code functionally puts all that stuff behind. And by the way, Cedar Falls, you're really lucky that uh, the founding uh, fathers and mothers laid out streets and blocks and alleys. That's, that's a huge advantage and makes this easier. Um, you shouldn't have to look at all this utility stuff. 
uh, in the code that has to be either in back or shielded from the street front by a, by a fence or a wall. And it's, uh, you know, we show a picture like this, which uh, I think you might recognize as some pretty new Cedar Falls development. We show these pictures and we say, it's really not rocket science, but it's sometimes so different than things had been done. Uh, it, it takes some effort to get all the rules rewritten and get them going in the same direction. Simple windows and doors, frequent doors. Uh, here's a, you know, try and find a front door on that street. Um, it's such a shame. Here's one that might, looks like it might be a little better, but there's no front door. Um, just kind of some trees buffering whoever has to live on the ground floor. Form-based code uh, doesn't allow that. It makes the buildings be connected to the street. More like that. <clears throat> uh, making that street, that small space, a, a high quality place is good for everyone, raises tr property values. Um, the code also has standards for reflective glass, especially on the ground floor. It's important to be able to see in. Um, if you if you end up with mirror glass like that, it's, it's pretty much the same as a blank wall. And uh, by the way, in the summer, if you get hit in the reflection of the setting sun, uh, you might get a tan, something. And uh, sort of the, it's not rocket science, but isn't it, it's, it's a natural thing on a storefront street to see inside and outside to see out. That interconnection is really positive. And as you know from the parkade, uh, it's good for everyone and, and good for business. Former base code has that. Uh, again, quality materials. This is a nice high quality brick, et cetera, but it can't save uh, a, a dead wall. Former base code has minimum standards for interactions, which means when you design a building from the start, you know that's going to happen. Retrofitting this building might be impossible, but new buildings, you just make sure they're designed to fit in the city. Um, and this is a really simple shop front window. Also, uh, also really nice. Simple things make great places. Frequent windows and doors. Um, and sorry, I have to show you a bad example now. Um, oftentimes, I'll, I'll, I don't know, I'll beat, on, uh, beat up on the developers. Uh, people have this idea that to make a really nice place, they kind of have a memory of a great place. So they, but they make these buildings that are kind of frenetic, zigging, zagging, different colors, sort of nervous, uh, too much variation. But they forget the fundamental things. So they put the parking in front. Uh, the way this form based code is written, that all is clearly for everyone uh, the way it should be. The stuff gets put in back and the, uh, the windows are to the front, windows and doors. And by the way, if you look at the shot of your parkade, uh, the buildings, those buildings are mainly actually really simple buildings. And this is a this is an A plus uh, street for sure. The buildings are all pretty simple. They have some elaboration around the doors and the windows, but they're all in a simple alignment and it's a great place. So the nervousness is not necessarily ready. Um, and I take a, take a little turn at the neighborhoods and things you can't do. This is not Cedar Falls, by the way. And you can't see much of the surrounding neighborhood here, but it's pretty obvious that this is a big blank wall on the street. People have their front doors going deep into the lot with a parking lot beside it. Uh, apartments are good things to have, but probably the last several uh, front doors down the way are really right next to somebody's backyard, deep in the lot, and it's out of scale, it's dead to the street, it's not really part of the community. Um, and we don't have to go outside of Cedar Falls to find some good examples of that good apartment buildings. <clears throat> uh, this building is a lot less offensive than that first one. Uh, it's, it's nice, but um, well, it, if you look in the back, of this photograph, you see there's some little bungalows. And what this building is, uh, is something that it's out of scale with the neighborhood. The neighborhood has details on it, like front porches, et cetera. This has a pretty flat front. There's no differentiation between the one, two, what? I think it's four units here 
um, it doesn't really engage the street or is divided. It doesn't, it doesn't meet the scale. It kind of violates the scale of its neighbors. In the neighborhoods, we have maximum building sizes, also requirements for the breakup of the facades and entry features like porches and stoops that would make this, uh, I almost want to say wouldn't make this not happen, but would make it happen in a better form. And uh, again, I think this is, uh, yes, State Street. Uh, and then there are also other row houses in an, an Iowa city nearby. It's going to say not to be named, but I guess I just did. Iowa City, uh, pretty much a brand new set of row houses, the different ways to do row houses, common wall attached. And by the way, I don't know if you've, uh, how many of you have noticed this little set of row houses on Main Street. Um, I, it may need a little bit of, uh, <coughs> a little bit of TLC, but actually it's a really cute set of row houses. They share a porch. Each porch has two doors on it. Uh, this looks like a really, uh, basically a really nice model to take up and, and build more of. Row houses can have front porches or stoops on the front. Uh, cottage courts, this is not Cedar Falls. You don't, well, you sort of have one of these already. This is Portland, Oregon. You can imagine somebody wants to live in a really small house, downsize, not have to take care of much. And... <coughs> Um, if you have noticed these, these are a particular kind of a cottage court. So there's actually three. There's a third building in back. It's really tiny cottage, uh, sorry, tiny court in front where all the entries are. Um, these are, um, I don't want to call them cute because uh, it's not a tough enough term, but they are. Uh, they also, it looks like they'd really be a good place to live. They've got the little, these little roof kind of decks cut into the side up above. You see it on this one. Also, what's really good about these is the one in back is arranged so that its, its windows aren't looking right into the neighbor's backyard. There's enough area in between that having uh, this set of uh, courtyard houses next to your house doesn't mean somebody's front window is in your backyard. And I'll say in the, the form-based code standards for cottage courts, we were careful about that as well. <coughs> Again, this is a, a set of duplexes a little bit more looking like, like two. Um, and then there, it's interesting. Uh, there's some really great models for, I hate the word duplex because it sounds, has so many bad connotations, but a two unit house, uh, there's some really good models in, uh, in your neighborhood. I don't know how familiar these look. And uh, things, houses, <laughs> Pardon me. Houses like this <clears throat> would fit into Overman Park area, I think, uh, seamlessly. Actually, I think one of those might already be there. So to end, um, I'm about to finally stop talking, but I want to bring us back into downtown, uh, the core of downtown, downtown, and kind of remind us what uh, the form-based code and the visioning brought us to there. Uh, street work, this is 4th Street. Um, We've already done some improvements on the on the sidewalks there recently, uh, but here's an idea about how new buildings can come in. <coughs> um, <clears throat> particular, this building was the model for uh, putting a, a parking structure. The upper floors of this are parking. The ground floor is retail, so on the street, it's just another building extending the downtown. But new buildings come in, they fill in line, new streetscape, and the downtown is, beyond the parkade, uh, a really 100% quality, uh, walkable American small town. Don't forget the bike racks. All right, is Mary back? I'm here, if I don't go off again. Um, just really quickly, um, next steps. The complete public review draft will be available at the our Cedar Falls website by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, so take a look, you can download it. Then we encourage you to read through it, um, review it, 
If you have questions or comments, you can submit those to planning staff, planning at cedarfalls.com. So that's sort of nuts and bolts information for looking at the code. Um, where do we go from here? Next, the schedule. Um, this spring over the next, uh, I think four to six weeks after you all have had a chance to look at it and there are gonna be some stakeholder meetings and uh, work sessions. The formal hearings for this proposed update to the downtown zoning code will take place. You, you all will have the, the first chance to uh, review, comment, hear from the public. Um, late spring, it's anticipated that you will make a recommendation on a draft version to move forward to the city council for their review. Um, with the goal that in the early summer, the city council will also then hold the review and public hearings um, with a target that this, the new downtown character district would be able to move to adoption by uh, mid to late summer. So that's the schedule that we are looking at, uh, working on continuing to work with the staff and then working with you all as uh, this review process gets underway. Um, and Karen, with that, I think we are ready for questions or if you have anything else you want to highlight before we go to questions. Okay. Um, so if Jeff could stop sharing his screen for a moment and then we can see if there's uh, any questions from the commission or if there's anybody in attendance at the meeting that might have questions or comments. Um, we have a few attendees um, in the meeting. So I'll let uh, Kyle kind of um, comment on that, but I know that uh, he's on his phone. So if there's people who want to raise their hand, um, there's a little hand icon if you've zoomed in and you have a particular question, you can certainly do that. But I think opening it up first for the commission to ask, ask any questions or make any comments. Yes, well, well, thank you for the awesome presentation. It's, it's incredible how much work goes into this and it's really exciting to see you know, how things could take shape. Um, I don't think I speak alone there. Um, I don't have any initial questions offhand, uh, excited about the next steps and the timing. Um, any questions on, on, on others on, for, for the presenters? And then also, I, don't I can't see this, but do we have anyone from the public that wishes to comment? Just raise your hand and... No, dumped a lot of information on y'all all at once. Yeah, so there'll be lots of opportunities to take a look at this. It'll be on uh, the city's, uh, um, the project webpage, ourcedarfalls.com. Um, as Mary said, um, by the end of the day tomorrow, we should be have that up. So certainly you can look on Friday and should be able to download the code if you want to, or look at it online. And then there'll be a number of opportunities over the next several months for the public to weigh in on this or ask questions for the commission to dive into the details here so that you're all comfortable with what's being uh, proposed. So lots of opportunities and we just invite everybody to, um, to take a look and make sure uh, you, know, you think that it's um, uh, validating what the community's vision is that was adopted with the downtown vision plan in no, uh, last, uh, I guess, November of 2019. And is the uh, first official public hearing our regular meeting next Wednesday? Do I understand that correctly? No, we won't have a public hearing. This will be, a, there'll be about a month, a little over a month of public review time. We knew that there's okay. a lot of information here for everybody to sort of absorb. So the commission will have a number of work sessions over the next several weeks. And those will just be um, for you to ask questions and make comments. And then we will set public hearing um, later in, uh, I think the first public hearing won't be till the end of March. That's what's anticipated anyway. Um, and then the public hearing would be in April and we'd anticipate then maybe by the end of April that you, the commission would be making its recommendation to the city council. So there'll be, we want to give everybody a chance to really take a look at this. Leanne Paul has a question. Yes. Um, 
Jeff mentioned that in that downtown area, the first floor would be retail. Is there a definition of what that includes? Does that mean no service office spaces? Or I'm just curious about that. There, there is, a, is a definition. Um, and what I believe is we've, uh, I don't have the definition right in front of me, but I believe we have defined it as retail and service. So the idea is it's the kind of businesses that you have people walking in and out of. Mm -hmm. uh, what is would be discouraged would be private offices because we really want to try to be away from people having their you know curtains or their shades closed all the time. You really, really want to have that be an active area. And that that would be, if you think back to the regulating plan that Jeff showed, it would be just if that that key area on the parkade. And once you got off of that on that regulating plan, it was all the red color. Um, in the other areas, it would really be flexible for the owner user developer. Jeff is in the correct. But, um, but no, uh, in addition, but you can have uh, a lobby or an entry to go upstairs. Sure. So it's not, you can certainly have that connection. All right, thank you. I love the plan. It's I, I just think oh, it would be so you. much easier for developers and and people wanting to do something down there. Thank you. I know Kyle, any other... I see, see everybody. I don't see any of the attendees, Kyle, that have their hands raised. So it doesn't look like any uh, questions or comments from the public at this time. I don't, I don't see any either. Any other questions, uh, initial questions from, uh, from commissioners? Um, well, seeing not, we'll look forward to the, uh, uh, to the next work section section and, uh, um, I guess entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. 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 Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks for Have having a great us. Day.